Today I want to talk about something different. Today I want to get a little bit more philosophical than I normally do when talking about innovation. Because I was asked the question recently, is innovation yin or is it yang? Now, I don't know how to answer that question, but I'm going to give it a try. And the way I'm going to go about it is I'm going to look at some of the things that we normally associate with yin and with yang and see how does that apply to innovation. So it's going to be a little bit of a methodical approach, but also a more rambling, more talkative, more, I want to say, discovery-oriented approach. Most of all, since I don't have with me a list of things that are associated with those two concepts, I found a list on the internet, which is very nice, simple one, Wikipedia even, and that means that I'll be looking away from you from time to time, and that's just to orient myself in what I'm talking about. But back to the core question, is innovation yin or is it yang? Let's look at what yin and yang even are. What are they associated with? Now, of course, I'm not going to go into the history. I'm not going to go into where this comes from. I'm going to go into this checklist of like, what do we associate with it? And the first thing is feminine and masculine. Now, on one hand, it's pretty easy to look at innovation like a masculine thing. It's about conquering. It's about change. It's about going out and wrestling the world until it does what you want it to. It's about not being satisfied with the status quo. It's aggressive. It's like it's pushy. It's all of these things that are typically masculine traits. On the other hand, it's pretty easy to argue that, that innovation is feminine. It's about change. It's about nurturing. It's about growth. It's about bending instead of breaking. It's about flowing instead of resisting. It's about not getting stuck in your ideas, which is very much a masculine trait, but adapting. So it could be easily said that innovation was masculine, if you look at it that way, but just as easily that it's feminine. So we'll call that a 1-1. One, one. Number two on the list is black and white. I don't think it makes any sense to talk about innovation when it comes to terms like black or white. If anything, it's colorful, it's a rainbow, it's a mess. It's that painting you did when you were a child and it started out being colorful, then it just got brown and weird and icky and you threw it away. But one of your parents took it and scratched off the layers of paint and found the beautiful colors beneath. Or maybe you got to the point where you learned how to paint well enough that it didn't just end up as this brown sop, but something actually came out of it. Black or white? I don't think it makes sense. Innovation to me is a rainbow of color. Dark or light? Interesting. Innovation is a little bit looking at things in a new light, but it's also finding things in the dark. It's often stumbling things, stumbling and trying to find things in the dark. There's a, a, an old joke about philosophy and about religion. We'll get into why it ties into innovation. It's one I got when I studied philosophy many, many years ago at the University of Copenhagen, and it stuck with me. And it was that the joke is that truth is a black cat in a dark room where there are no lights on and it doesn't exist. That's truth, according to philosophers. Religion is saying, I found the cat. Whether you like that or not, it's up to you. I've always found it a little bit, a little bit cheeky, a little bit aggrandizing for the philosophers, but also a little bit profound in some way. Is innovation dark or is it light? I think that's another one-one. Because innovation without putting things into the light is impossible. On the other hand, if you're never stumbling in the dark, if you're never going into places where there is no light, where nobody's been before, or at least somebody hasn't looked in a long time, then you're going to have a hard time innovation. That's two-two so far. North and South, there's a whole long discussion that's pretty interesting about how linguistically we tend to associate North with something better than South. We tend to see it as more noble, more pure, more true, more strong. Northern Europe versus Southern Europe. Northern America, Southern America. There, there's, yeah, I realize these are not the only examples out there, but just before I get started on a long rant about this, North-South, 
I don't see it. We'll, we'll skip that one. Water or fire. Again, this might be linked back to the masculinity-femininity discussion from earlier, but is innovation more water or is it more fire? Well, in some ways it's fire, it's disruption, it's brutal, it's destructive, it tears things apart, it burns things to ashes, literally, it changes and it destroys. On the other hand, it's always in motion, it's ever-changing. It's hard to pinpoint. You can stab and stab, and it's like, it's like not punching a pillow, but punching the ocean. If I had to come down on one of those, I'd say that to me, innovation is more water than fire, but maybe that's just, maybe that's just my upbringing. Maybe that's just my gendered way of looking at the world speaking. Again, let's call it a tie, but if I had to choose, I'd say more fire than water, but not enough that it matters. Is it moon or is it sun? I don't know. The sun, it's big. It's life-giving. It's also incredibly brutal, destructive, unyielding, unfathomable, full of energy, full of power, but also full of death and also of explosive, explosive energy. Moon? Well, it's a small bunk of, it's a small like piece of rock, right? Floating around the earth. On the other hand, it's pretty critical as part of the earth's ecosystem. It gives us things that make life as we know it possible. It's also a pretty interesting destination, right? It's been popular for a long while. But again, if I had to come down on something, I'd say that innovation is more sun than it is moon. It's more this grand force that we try to tame and fail at than this dream that we have and we've tried to get to for years and that captures our imagination but that in the end ends up being worth more resources than it's worth or does it that's another way of looking at innovation and at the moon but for me in this one i go with the sun so if we're holding count yang is slightly ahead slightly ahead that leaves us to earth, not earth as the element, but the earth and heaven. So for me here, there's a clear one, that the earth innovation for me is about something real. Philosophy is about the heavens. Religion is about the heavens. Thought, logic even. You might say that those are big abstract concepts that transcend us mere humans, but innovation I think the only time where it makes sense to talk about innovation is in a human context. Because who cares about innovation if there's nobody to innovate for? We could also get into a long philosophical or maybe even science fiction style debate about are there other life forms? Do the dolphins innovate? What about monkeys? That sort of thing. Sure, I get that. But leaving that aside for the moment, I'd say that innovation is much more tied to the earth and to the heavens. It's about doing something that that you can feel. It's about doing something that changes what we'd call objective reality, even though that's a tricky term in itself. So for this, a clear point for me, at least, to Ying. Warm or cold? Is innovation warm or is it cold? Sometimes, if we're talking feelings, innovation is this bubbly, like emotional champagne. It's this eureka moment. It's this... <gasps> I could do it differently. The world could be in a way that it isn't right now, and it might just be possible. This feeling of oh, possibility. On the other hand, a lot of innovation is cold, it's rational, it's lab-driven, it's experimental, it's let's stack it like this, let's try this, let's use a bigger hammer, let's move it over here, let's count backwards. It's cold, it's rational, it's definitely, I'm not gonna say inhuman, but I'm going to say at least very much dependent on rationality instead of emotions. Warm or cold? Again, one, one. Is it even numbers or odd numbers? I'm just going to skip that one because there's, if you're a mat mathematician or a good stand-up comedian, you might be able to make a lot of that. Me, I'm a too simple kind of guy. So I'm just going to leave that one for the experts. 
Mountains or valleys? Oh, and that's a bit interesting. Is innovation mountains or is it valleys? Well, some might say that it's mountains that you can't get to without going through valleys, but that's also a lie. Sometimes you're just lucky. Sometimes you're just like, oh, I had a great idea. Oh, it could actually happen. Oh, let's try. Oh, it worked. Oh, the world is now better. Sometimes it's valleys. Sometimes you never get out of it. Sometimes it just leads nowhere. Sometimes you're down in the muck and you look for the horizon and all you see is sheer cliff faces holding you from getting up. Now, the tricky thing with valleys and mountains is that depending on your perspective, they might just look the same. If you're standing at one of those cliff faces and you're looking into the cliff, you can't really see if it's a mountain or a valley. I know you probably can in reality, but in this example, just to humor me, right? They look the same if you're staring at the wall. But if you're looking outwards, there's a huge difference between a mountain and a valley. There's a difference in the view. There's a difference in the texture. There's a difference in the feel of the experience itself. Now, both of them have to do with altitude, with moving either up or down. I'd have to say that if I had to choose between them, I'd give Yang the point and say that it's more mountains than it's valleys. On the other hand, inventors, innovators, people who think differently, dreamers, well, they tend to go through at least one or two mental valleys before getting anywhere. Close, but I'd say the point goes to Yang. Is it poor or is it rich? Now, this one, this is interesting. This tickles my sense of the real. Is innovation done when we're poor or when we're rich? Now, the truth is, and this is something that I teach a lot of people, is that there are three basic stages, three basic kind of states for humans when it comes to change and also for organization. There's the desperate stage where we're just about to fall off the cliff and we know it, things are going badly, it's not good. This is the desperate stage. At this point, we're willing to try anything. New name, new logo, new business plan, new partner, new look at life, new diet. When we're desperate, when we see that burning platform that consultants have been talking about for years and years, then we're willing to do something different. Then we're willing to innovate like crazy. The closer we are to the edge, the less room we have to maneuver, but the more we're willing to take chances. So that's at one end of the spectrum. That's definitely an innovation place, being desperate, being poor in this case, whether it's poor in time, poor in resources, poor in anything. That's when we're willing to try out new stuff. At the other end of the spectrum is when we're rich. When we're Google, we say, oh, oh, we make so much money on our core business. Let's try this thing. Oh, spend a billion dollars. Oh, it didn't work. Well, let's try it again. We have a moonshot factory. We go for the big wins and we celebrate when things go wrong because then we don't have to try them out anymore. I love that mentality, but you need to be rich. You need to be strong. You need to feel invulnerable to be there. It's that couple you know that is so happy. They're still madly in love even after 15 years. They just had child number three, and they've decided to take up tango lessons. You kind of hate them, but you also pretty much envy them because they are so invulnerable. They're so in a place of surplus, of richness, that they take chances. Oh, sure, we'll try out something new. Oh, let's, let's let in a new member. Let's try out a new tactic. Let's figure out a new product. Let's take a chance on this. Because if it goes wrong, we're still doing fine. A place of richness. Innovation also happens there. It's a lot more pleasant to be part of than kind of the desperate type. And it happens there. In the middle, the closer we get to the middle, the closer we are to nothing happening. Because people will say, and you've probably heard these things, oh, we want to innovate. Just not right now. We don't have time. I'd love to get help, but I don't have the resources right now. I can't do it. I can't, I can't one thing or the other. I can't take in more. Yes, yes, it's important, but what about tomorrow? I have a board meeting to go to. That middle, that status quo middle, between yin and yang, that's where nothing happens. Well, not true. Not nothing. Just nothing new. Just nothing different. Because we're not desperate enough to have to take chances and we're not feeling rich enough, we're not feeling strong enough and invulnerable enough that we feel the chances won't hurt us. 
and therefore we just plod along until things either start going better we start taking smaller chances because oh it's great let's have an innovation department or at least make an innovation day or change tuesday or whatever we want to call it or they start going worse and we're like uh oh there's the edge we're being disrupted things are going badly ah better start moving but as long as we're there in the center there's no innovation so the answer to is it poor or is it rich? I'd say that's another one, one. Now, is it soft or is it hard? In one way, innovation is hard. And I'm not talking about hard as in like, it's a tough thing to do, but in, in kind of in perspective towards soft here. It's about unyielding numbers. It's about reality that kind of needs to be twisted, that needs to be bent. It's about changing the world. It's about doing big things. It's about making things kind of bend to your will. It's hard. It's also, it's also not like, it's not something you can poke at in that way. It resists you. On the other hand, it's the exact opposite. It's soft, it's flowing, it's chaotic, it's hard to measure, it's, it's hard to do anything about. It's like pushing a, pushing a cloud is innovation soft or is it hard? I think to me it's more soft than it's hard. Resistance to innovation, that's hard. That's surfaces, that's walls, that's boundaries. But innovation itself, pushing, pushing, trying, testing, feeling, prototyping, experimenting, that's more soft than it's hard. So that goes one for yin. And finally, does it provide spirit to all things or does it provide form to all things? I'm afraid I'm going to get into some pretty deep philosophical water if I go down that road. So I'm just going to say, that's the same. Or not the same, of course it's not. One is yang, the other is yang. But, equals there. So to look at it from that perspective, feminine, masculine, one, one. Black, white, doesn't matter. Doesn't really make sense. Dark, light, two, two. South, north, also meaningless. Water or fire? Fire for me, so let's call that 3-2. Active and passive, I even forgot that. And there, to me, innovation is a clear active. So that brings us to 2-4. Four. 4 for yang at the moment, 2 for ying. Sun or moon? Again, it's a little bit moon. A little bit. No, sorry, sorry, a little bit sun. So that's 5-2. to two. Is it heaven or earth? It's definitely heaven for me. It's definitely earth. This gets a lot more complex because I'm slipping over the words. It's earth for me in this. So three, five to ying right now. Three ying, five yang. Is it warm or is it cold? It's both. Six, four. Is it young or is it old? We'll, we'll leave that one because this has gone on for long enough. Is it odd or even? Doesn't make sense. Is it mountains or valleys? And there I settled on the mountains. So that brings it to a 7-4. Is it rich or poor? It's both. It's definitely both. It's 8-5. Is it soft or hard? And there I settled on soft. That's 8-6. And finally, it both provides spirit to all things and form to all things. 9-7. Nine, 9 for yang and 7 for ying. Now, what does that mean? Why do you care? If you've gotten to this, if you've gotten this far in the keynote, why did you care? Why did this matter to you? Why does it matter to me? Why did I even bother answering this in this weird, methodical way? Well, for several reasons. Reason number one is that I think one of the disciplines of innovation, one of the disciplines of thinking what if, is the ability to take anything and look at it in a structured manner, look at it like, what if we applied X to Y, even though it doesn't necessarily make sense? Asking the question, is innovation more yin or is it more yang? That doesn't necessarily make sense. But here we tried, or at least I tried. I tried applying some sort of methodology to it, and I came up with a result, 9-7. Now, is that a satisfactory result? Is it a good result, a bad one? I don't know, but I learned something from doing it. Maybe you learned something from watching it. Maybe there's something out there where you're thinking, huh, I could apply that way of thinking or that principle of a way of thinking somewhere else. And that to me is interesting. And that 
is part of learning to be an innovator or teaching yourself the kind of the mindset of innovation is this learning to apply things in places where they don't necessarily belong. So that's one reason I did this. A second reason is, well, a second reason that you might be following at this point is that maybe, maybe you enjoy a good philosophical romp. Maybe you enjoy a good kind of set of mind, I'm not going to call it mind games, but at least kind of just letting it go and seeing where it takes you. And innovation is very much that. Sometimes it's the guided, it's the targeted, it's with a certain goal in mind. But sometimes it's just random thoughts. It's just watching and seeing where the wind takes you, seeing what comes out of this, rolling the dice to see what comes up, taking a look and saying, huh, oh, okay, I'm going to ask the next question and the next one. And, the, and suddenly you're somewhere completely different. That might also be another reason that you watched this. And it's definitely a reason that I did this. And then there's the third one, and that's that the way we talk about things matters a lot. If you approach somebody and you know that to them, yin and yang are central concepts in their life, they're things that are a core part of defining how they view the world, then it might not be that bad to have an answer to the question, is innovation more yin or is it more yang? To people who don't think that way, to people or whom it's just a, a fancy concept from Eastern philosophy, maybe from the third century, something like that. If that's, if that's what you know of yin and yang, and you, of course, know the black and white symbol, then maybe that's not a relevant question to, to answer at all. But for somebody who cares, for somebody who, who believes or who thinks, or for who this makes sense, then maybe that question makes sense and having an answer to it makes sense. And even if you don't, even if none of these three reasons kind of got you to where you are, then I think it's worth asking yourself, not necessarily, is innovation the yin or is it the yang? But what question can you ask that will lead you into interesting and new territory? Whether you think, okay, I hope this would end well, Klaus, and you just let me down the most terrible way. Whether you think that or you think, ah, that's an interesting point. One thing that's certain about innovation is that a huge part of it is finding ways to make ourselves ask questions that we hadn't asked before. Because if we don't ask those questions, then we're never going to bother with finding out the answers, and neither is anybody else. So with that, thank you. Thank you for listening to this. This was probably my weirdest innovation keynote yet. Strangely satisfying.